ordinary regiment that was drawn up in perfect formation to salute Lady Patricia Ramsey, daughter of the late Duke of Connacht. It was her regiment, the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. This is the unit, second senior of Canada's Permanent Force Infantry, which has proudly borne her name in two great wars. A unit that won high honor in 1914-1918, a unit which has done much to maintain military skill throughout Western Canada. On this day, the Patricias marched once again past their Colonel-in-Chief, reminding her vividly of that day in 1914, when, as the Princess Patricia, she reviewed the newly formed unit that was marching off to war, and beginning a tradition for fighting and efficiency that is second to none. The business of getting a message back safely is sometimes a bit of a problem. And even in this modern war with its scientific communications, sometimes it's best to resort to the old ways. A pigeon does not break wireless silence. A pigeon doesn't get his map references mixed. A pigeon gets through, come hell or high water. He did at the up. In peacetime, pigeons are raced by pigeon fanciers as a hobby. Today, British pigeons and Canadian fanciers serve in the Canadian Army, and the strange, unerring instinct of the Homer is ready to take the place of wireless or DR or the telephone if need be. Swiftly they deliver their message to the home loft, and uh, just by the way, carrier pigeons are too tough to eat. Try a Don R instead. came to a Canadian General Hospital when Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, sister of His Majesty the King, paid it a short visit. Wearing the uniform of the ATS, she chatted with the patients, some of them veterans of Dieppe, the and from the staff learned about the workings of a great military hospital. Canadian Army is proud of its medical services and especially proud to present them to such an interested and charming visitor. Canadian soldiers never die, even when umpires officially kill them on exercises. They just fade away to a farm and help the land army with threshing and bailing. Here, when the rest of the army was sweating over Spartan, casualties were coming to life to add to the Canadian Army's good reputation for lending a practiced hand on the farm. We have been able to help with the harvest over here. We've been officially commended for it. And what with one thing and another, we like it. For the second year in succession, the luck of the draw brought Canada and Norway together in the second round of the Inter-Allied Services Soccer Cup. Last year, the Norwegians were too good for us, and this year told the same story. On the much-blitzed West Ham football grounds, the CRU team, representing the Canadian Army, fought gamely, but it was no match for the tricky Northerners. The game ended with the Norwegians on the long end of a 10-2 score. Brigadier J.C. Stewart presented the Norwegians with maple leaf badges, while the Canadians received Norwegian crests from Major General Bateman, Commander-in-Chief of the Norwegian Army. We may have lost the game, but we won good comradeship. The British people have been good hosts to the Canadian Army for three war-torn years. And so we were glad to show a representative group of English mayors that we are paying guests who will soon earn our keep on the battlefields of Europe. During a two-day tour, the visitors saw the Canadians in all forms of training. Perhaps the highlight of the tour was the visit to the Blitz section of an armored car regiment, where the mayors met the CO who at 25 
is the youngest lieutenant colonel in the Canadian Army. Schoolgirls from a nearby convent were the unofficial guests of a Canadian heavy ACAC battery when they paid a visit to the gun sites and had a good look at the big guns that are keeping enemy raiders at a distance. The battery is situated in a residential district on the outskirts of London and has had pretty good luck against the Hun. The girls and their teachers know full well that these Canadian gunners have played a big part in protecting them. It was a big day for the little girls and a big day for the gunners, for they got a real kick out of showing their young guests just what makes the Nazis nervous. When incendiary bombs fall in London, they now have new firefighters to contend with. Yes, the girls of the Canadian Women's Army Corps are pretty hot stuff. Here, under the watchful and slightly apprehensive eye of London's professional firemen, they are learning to turn off the heat. They are from a company of the CWAC who have joined us in the Canadian Army overseas, and they are practicing in bombed-out buildings in London. They made the practice so realistic that they nearly finished the job the Germans had started, and watching London firemen had to stop watching and take a hand themselves so the fire wouldn't get out of hand. Although the quacks cannot join the rest of the Canadian Army in the field of operations, they are already doing a first-class job behind the lines. And in the event of air attack, they are ready to stand shoulder to shoulder with the people of Britain and serve on the battlefront of not-so-passive air defense. A crowd of some 15,000 people gathered by the cockpit in Hyde Park to see and hear the Canadian Army's masked bands inaugurate this year's big war savings campaign, Wings for Victory Week. There were 118 bandsmen from the bands of the Canadian Armoured Corps, Royal Canadian Artillery, Royal Canadian Army Service Corps, and the Infantry Reinforcement Units. They marched and countermarched to the streams of the Standard of St. George. amaze the ears and loosen the pockets of the fashion acts with their weird wailings. It was a proud sight as the kilts swung by, kilts showing the tartan of a dozen called units, the Seaforts, the 48th, the Camerons of Ottawa, the Toronto Scottish, the Black Watch, the Glengarrian, the Queen's Own Cameron, the Canadian Scottish, the Highland Light Infantry, the North Nova Scotian, the Essex Scottish, the Cape Breton, the Calgarys. Tartans which symbolize the close bond between Canada and the ancient highlands. Vincent Massey spoke briefly, followed by squadron leader Leroy, the famous VC bomber pilot. And altogether it was a grand show, reminiscent of peacetime tattoos and started Wings for Victory Week off with a real bang. The Londoners dug deep into their pants pockets and came up with 163 million pounds, 13 million over the target. And money is a vital weapon of war. Money to speed the bombers and the fighters and the ships and the tanks and the guns that soon 
will blast the Hun from the face of the earth.